Hello, fellow foodies, and welcome back. This is Dr. Cassandra Quaid, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, today, we have a really special um, episode because I have not one, not two, not three, but four amazing guests that are going to tell us all about wild tomatoes, hunting tomatoes, especially um, in the Australian outback. So let me start by introducing you to a few of our guests, or all of the guests actually, one at a time. We've got our first is Dr. Chris Martin. He's a David Burphy professor in plant genetics and research at Bucknell University, where he's also the chair of the Department of Biology and director of the Manning Herbarium. He's won many awards, published um, more than 40 articles and journals and two field guides, and has mentored, get this, more than 80 undergrads and master's students in research. Chris is also the creator and host of the YouTube video series, Plants Are Cool Too, um, and was recently elected to be a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London. Our next guest is Dr. Tanisha Williams. Um, Tanisha is the Richard and Yvonne Smith Postdoctoral Fellow in Botany at Bucknell University, and her dissertation research examined the impacts of climate change on plant species throughout South Africa. And her postdoctoral research, which we'll be talking about more today, elucidates the role that Aboriginal peoples have on the movement and maintenance of plant species and understanding how biogeographic barriers impact species distributions in Australia. Our next guest is um, Dr. Rebecca Bird. Dr. Bird has written extensively on a wide range of, of topics from costly signaling theory to women's hunting and fire ecology. Um, but her most recent projects center on dynamic relationships between people, species, and landscapes. And last but not least, we have Amy Robleski. She's an ecology PhD candidate at Penn State, working on questions surrounding food sovereignty with foraged foods, both plants and fungi. So we have really an awesome lineup, and I want to thank you all so much for coming on the show today. It's great to see everybody. Good to see thank you, you for having us. <laughs> Awesome. Well, why don't we start um, just by a little bit of background about this fun um, discovery project around hunting for wild solanum species um, in Australia. Maybe, Chris, you can kind of kick us off. Yeah, sure. I mean, the thing that kind of brought us all together is a uh, focus on these these plants called bush tomatoes. It's a, a group of, you know, something like 40 or 50 different species that live across northern Australia, and they're all in the in the genus Solanum. So they're close relatives to, to potatoes, tomatoes, uh, and eggplants. Um, but there's a whole bunch of these things that live in the Australian monsoon tropics and are, and are interesting for so many different reasons. And for years, I've been studying because of their reproductive biology and looking at their evolutionary relationships. Uh, but one thing I never really got to study was the ethnobotanical stuff related to these species. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff to learn, a lot of stuff I certainly had no idea about. Um, and that's why I was so grateful when uh, Dr. Bird reached out to me and told me about some work that she's been doing in the Western desert for a really long time. So, Rebecca, if you can maybe you can explain that. Yeah, so I've been working um, in an, a, a remote community of Aboriginal people, Mardu people, in a, in a very remote part of Western Australia. Um, we have been living and working in the community for the past 20 years, learning about documenting traditional hunting, gathering landscape use. And our focus has been on the way that the use of fire creates plant diversity at the landscape scale, and then how this diversity of vegetation types influences animals and then how this in turn feeds back to influence the productivity and the sustainability of marduk hunting and gathering <laughs> that's great that's great um well i know so you're you're going in the field but you're also bringing things back to the lab and i think that's where tisha you're really doing some cool stuff tell us about your work in the lab on these samples Yes, it's been really nice to tap into um, this group, this collaborative group, doing work with the Mardu community and also doing work with students that we have here in the U.S. And so after uh, we learn more about the traditional ecological um, knowledge of the Mardu community and uh, what they're using this bush tomato for, they want to know about the health and the uh, health of the populations that they're managing. And so really our question is looking at 
uh, these populations that are managed by the Mardu community and comparing their genetic health to populations that are outside of the Mardu community and um, comparing those two types of populations. And so that's where uh, I come in, where Amy come, uh, come in to do this uh, genomics work. Awesome. And Amy, so I know your stuff is, your interests are more on the food sovereignty side. Are these, are these Solanum species edible? Like, are they using these as food? Yeah. So bush tomato refers to a lot of different species. So some of them are, and some of them aren't. The species that we're looking at, Solanum diversiflorum, is edible and is used by communities as an important source of food, but also important to keep in mind that this is a desert so not only is it nutritionally important but they're also a source of water um so overall just a really important food out there have you have you tried them how do they what do they taste like yeah um i tried them in the field this summer i would say the closest flavor is similar to a pepino but in terms of foods that most people would have access to at the grocery store in North America, probably closest to a cantaloupe or a honeydew, but almost with like a peppery flavor to it. That sounds amazing. That sounds really cool. So the, the story of the tomato that I'm most familiar with is one that we all love and eat, and that's a Solanum species. Is it Solanum lycopersicum? Is that, is that the right one? Okay. That's right. And yep. so and this one was discovered in Mesoamerica and then eventually made its way to Europe where everyone thought it was a poison for a very long time. And we have very old herbarium specimens um, in kind of these collections in Rome. Um, and now today we, we consume this tomato all over the globe. But you're really talking about other types of tomatoes. It's, it's related. They're kind of like sisters to one another, but they're not, they're not the same species. So did these tomatoes also originate in Mesoamerica or do we know like, or, or are there origins actually in Australia? Yeah, this group of things. So they're called bush tomatoes, but they're actually, if we were to sort of say which of the cultivated nightshades they're most closely related to, it would be the eggplant. Um, and so these are sort of um, what we might call spiny solanums. They have prickles on them. And this group that, that Wamala, the species Solanum diversiflorum is part of, um, is uh, really an Australian group, but it's probably been there for something like 5 million years. So we're looking at sort of an origin of this group about 5 million years ago that has radiated from that point. And, and the work that we've been doing a lot of is describing a lot of um, undescribed species in this group because it, it does seem like the evolution of this group is just ongoing, right? Like the, it's diversifying almost right before our eyes as as climate things begin to fluctuate in Australia. So so an origin of the nightshades in, in sort of the new world, so-called new world tropics, and then uh, radiation to other parts of the world, in, including Australia, where these are all native. Amazing. And so I'd love to learn more about the traditional uses of these bush tomatoes um, and also their management, because I know that you mentioned, for example, Rebecca, you mentioned the use of fire. How does fire play into management of this? Of this? Is it a wild food or are they also cultivating it or is it kind of somewhere in between? <laughs> so, um, Mardu, uh, how they use fire uh, to manage these food plants is that they burn small patches of this hummock grass called spinifex in order to hunt small animals like monitor lizards, feral cats, other kinds of burrowed prey. And this type of hunting is done mostly by women. And as women move across the landscape, they're hunting, they're burning, they create this uh, very fine grained mosaic of regrowth following fire. And we've been able to show over the 20 years that we've worked with the community, as Marty tell us, that this kind of mosaic supports a higher population of the animals they hunt, and particularly sand monitor lizards. But it also supports a greater diversity of plant species. And this is something that we've only been only recently started to push our attention to. It takes several years for this dense spinifex grass to go grow back after being burned. But before it returns, the burned patch is populated with a wide diversity of different plants that take advantage of these open habitats following a fire. Many of these are important food plants. So Solanum diversiflorum, Wamala, is one of those plants. And as time goes on, these burnt patches begin to be dominated by spinifex once more, which crowds out all the diverse food plants that people and other animals rely on. 
Um, and so a dense patch of this uh, fruit will be gone after two to three years. So women in the process of hunting small animals with fire then create this optimal habitat for guamala to thrive. But that's not all that they do. So the seeds inside the fruit are very bitter and they're inedible. And so in the process of cleaning the fruit, Mardu also disperse the seed within the patch and they carry, sometimes carry whole fruit to a new location. And when they do that, they act as long distance seed dispersers. So in places where people have cleaned the fruit and, and, and thrown the seed out, I've seen new plants growing um, in the heart of an old fire uh, three years after the fruit was carried there from 10 kilometers away. And it's also really efficient to clean the fruit in the patch because the fruit is hollow. Right? So that's that round fruit and it's hollow inside. You cut it open, you shake the seeds out, and then you can actually stack the fruit together in your dish and create more space. So you can carry more fruit that way. That's amazing. So when you're showing this to your hands, it looks like this is almost the size of like a tennis ball. Is it, is it that large? That was just for effect, right? So oh, just effect. Okay. They're only about that big. Yeah. Okay. So they're like more of like a ping pong ball. Of size. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's interesting though. So they're hollow in the inside. You shake out the seeds, but you know, it sounds like you're not consuming these raw in the, in the bush. They're not eating these raw. How are they processed then to make them edible after you remove these edible seeds? Uh, you can eat them raw. You can. Eat oh, them raw. okay. Yeah. And they're quite sweet, but they don't, they also vary um, in their level of sweetness. And that's one thing that Amy is looking at in the greenhouse, right? So People will test the fruit and some will be sweet. They'll consume it. They'll also test it. It'll be kind of bitter and they'll throw that through fruit out. So there definitely is a preference for in the field for fruit that is sweet and they're testing it and then putting the sweeter fruit in their basket and carrying it away with them. And then, but you can also, like you can cook a pepper or anything else, any other salonum, right? So they roast them in the fire. Amazing. So there, there you've got on-site selection happening. That's really exciting. So I imagine um, Tanisha, that's probably, you're probably seeing the effects of this on-site selection in your population genomics studies. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And how does that tie into Amy's work with, you know, determining different traits of these, of these wild plants? It's such a cool study to see. And we're so happy that the genetics is showing exactly what we thought was happening, what um, Rebecca was talking about, how um, the Mardu managing these populations and being these long distance dispersers and processing these fruits, we're seeing a lot of gene flow and a lot of genetic diversity in the populations that are within the community and managed by the community. And when we look at Wamala, Salinum diversiflorum, outside of these communities, the genetic diversity is very low, the populations are smaller, they're isolated, and these are signals of genetics that we don't like to see in a healthy population. So we're definitely seeing those um, signatures. And I would love to hear more about Amy and talking about how the fruit and the sweetness of the fruit that she's finding. Yeah, so I'm measuring a bunch of physical traits of the fruit, but one of them is sweetness, and that's just using a little handheld spectrometer. So you just take the fruit, squeeze it out, ideally through a strainer so you don't get a lot of pulp, and it gives you a reading of the sweetness. And I'm using that so that way I could also take those measurements while we were in the field this past summer. So the greenhouse work was largely a result of COVID panic. Um, we couldn't leave the country. Australia was shut down for a lot of years. So I started growing these plants in the greenhouses here at Penn State. In the end, this ended up being a great thing because now we have a data set of both the sweetness in the field of these plants that are growing in Australia all around the region. And then also these plants growing in the greenhouse at Penn State in extremely controlled conditions. So we can compare what is an environmental factor versus what might be more shaped by the genetics that we're seeing. But overall, what we're seeing is sweetness is super variable, but tends to clump within patches. So you could have a plant or a patch that is very, very sweet and others that are extremely bitter, but they're all, in the range of things that we might eat every day. So the hardest fruit would probably be somewhere around a cranberry, which that's pretty tart, but you can still eat a cranberry. 
the sweetest is somewhere around an apple or a pear. So obviously, like Rebecca said, people are, prefer those really, really sweet fruits if they can get them. So I'm interested to see, is there a certain amount of selectness, se selection for things like sweetness? That's amazing. So when you're talking about sweetness here, are we talking about like actual levels of, of plant sugars in, in the fruit or is there some other kind of, you know, sweetening compound that, that, that they're producing? Yeah. So the handheld spectrometer just looks at sucrose levels okay. just because the logistics of getting the plants in the field to a place where they could get, be processed for other types of sugars was just wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've talked to some people in food science here about maybe doing some additional analyses on the plants in the greenhouse because the perk of growing plants in the greenhouse is the food science building is right across the street. Um, but right now it's just sucrose levels. That's great. I mean, of course, as, as someone that is fascinated with plant chemistry and also indigenous knowledge, the next question I have has to do with, you know, are there other traits or indicators that, um, that the Martu people have talked about? Like, are there certain varieties or certain populations that perhaps survive better or are more pest resistant that they've noted? Did you guys see any, any of that kind of information in working with the Martu? Maybe I'll kick this one to Rebecca since you're not really. Yeah, I, have, I haven't I have really heard much talk about differences like that, like population level differences. I mean, the only thing I have heard people talk about is that, you know, these plants over here are sweet, so let's go for those. That's great. I mean, it, it makes me think of other ways that we manage crops in the wild. A good example is, you know, kala kala or piper methysticum. You know, people will taste it. They'll say, okay, well, this this root, you know, really has a strong effect of the effect that you're trying to get from that particular plant, and they'll plant more of that. And so it's interesting how, how you can really, you know, manipulate the ecosystem through these desirable traits. I do have some broader questions I want to get to. Maybe I'll come back to Chris because this is not the first expedition you've run. Um, I know I love watching the, the the photos that you share and the stories you share on social media about these expeditions. Um, for the listeners out there, I'm sure this idea of heading off into the wild looking for plants, you know, the mis mystery tomatoes sounds like kind of a crazy, fun adventure. What can you share with us about, you know, what it's really like to be a field botanist and go out with the team? Yeah, that's a pretty amazing thing to get to do as a job, right? This this trip we took this past summer and, and the four of us sort of split up into parts of two different teams. But this trip for me was my, my seventh time in, in uh, about 20 years that I was able to go and, and work across the Australian monsoon tropics, which is a, you know, really big span of land, right? I mean, we usually are sort of within this space that's about sort of like New York to Chicago and traveling across there and looking looking for plants. And um, I think that I maybe am never happier um, ever than when I'm out in the field hunting for cool plants and um, looking for them and, and learning about them and being in these amazing spaces. So um, it's a pretty imp incredible place to, to travel. And uh, these particular plants are are in some amazing spots, right? So it's it's been neat. And it's been especially cool to travel with amazing people like these folks, right? So you get to go out there and not just sort of explore and find things and learn things, but also learn from each other. And when you got different sets of eyes around you, it's uh, it's pretty, um, pretty awesome. Um, bringing students out into these places is also pretty incredible. On this past trip, um, a Bucknell current senior, Claire Marino, was able to travel with our group and uh, to introduce somebody to that and sort of maybe, you know, uh, spark some passion in them to be a field botanist and to do this kind of biodiversity work is also just an awesome opportunity. So. That's great. Well, one thing I, I really admire about the work that you all do, too, is is really your, your passion for science communication. And I want to ask Tanisha a little bit about this, because you did something really amazing in um, really launching this Black Botanist Week and raising awareness um, around botanists coming from all different areas of the world. What can you tell us about that and kind of what's that journey been like and, and what kind of feedback have you gotten from students and people that perhaps didn't know that much about botany before before this initiative. It's been such a wonderful journey to um, be a part of the Black Botanist Week movement. 
We started in 2020, and I always say there are 12 of us on the Black Botanist Week committee members. We're as diverse as the plants that we love. We're from the U.S., we're from the U.K., and we're from South Africa. And it's just been a magnificent journey to meet these people and work with them. And most of it has been online. I only knew two of the Black Botanist Week committee members before this all started, and I met another two um, during the botany conference. So I've only met four <laughs> of the 11 other Black Botanist Week members. And I've, we've gotten so much support from so many different avenues, from arboretums to societies, garden clubs, to houseplant lovers and all the likes of the support of highlighting diverse folks in the botanical space. And I've gotten so many DMs and just uh, mainly saying that I never knew that you could be a botanist for a living and I've never seen a black person be a botanist for a living. So it's been just a wonderful um, experience and it's nice to connect with other people and see all the cool work that folks are doing. No, it's really amazing. It's it's such an exciting um, week to see. I mean, I've I've learned more about about amazing science happening across the field through this initiative, and I want to thank you for that too. I mean, it's it's great, and I know Chris. Also, you're doing a lot of SciComm. Um, I love your YouTube channel. Plants are cool too. You know, tell us about that. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've been making these videos. I work with a couple of um, editor videographers named Paul Frederick and, and Tim Kramer. We've been making these for about a decade. So there's, I don't know, 14 or 15 episodes. Um, and uh, it's really meant as a way to highlight not just cool plants, but the cool people who study those plants and, um, you know, get hopefully get more young people interested in not just plants and botany, but also just biodiversity conservation um, and things related to that. Um, I'm super excited to announce right here on your podcast that we have a new episode coming out really soon. So this very project we're talking about is uh, is going to be the next episode. So there there is a Plants Are Cool too. Um, Rebecca and I largely filmed a bunch of stuff with our phones while we were out there and then brought that back. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were here at the Bucknell campus with Paul and we were we were doing our interviews and doing all that stuff. So um, we're, we're currently in the sort of rough edit stage, but there will be a new episode coming out really soon. And I think a lot of the stuff we've talked about with you today about this project will be illustrated really well in that video. And I'm, I'm super stoked about it. So I hope people check it out once it uh, once it gets released. Absolutely. And folks, you can you can do that by um, subscribing to the Plants Are Cool 2 channel on YouTube. Really cool. I can't wait to see it. That sounds amazing. I think those are the best, like videos from the field, even when they're, I mean, now we have such great, you know, technology with, with phones. So you can catch a lot of great detail um, with something that fits in your pocket. So that's that's pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah, there's really a lot of fantastic footage. I mean, Rebecca got all the things that Rebecca's talking about, about people managing the land and using fire and out there, and you know, managing the, the landscape and things. All of that stuff is represented in, in, in footage that she shot out there. So it's it's going to be pretty cool to see. That's amazing. Very cool. Well, um, I guess I have a couple other questions about the project. I mean, this is just so fascinating, this work. Um, I know that we on the show, we talk a lot about food so food security, food sovereignty, and also kind of really just the need to be prepared for the agricultural needs of the future, um, especially in, in a warming climate with increased, you know, issues due to pollution and um, spread of plant pathogens and human pathogens. <laughs> so there are a lot of different struggles we're, we're, we're up against. And I just want to know if you guys can comment a little bit about why this work is so important. I think a lot of people think that we've just found all the foods we have, they're in the stores and that's that. But that's not the case, is it? There are a lot of foods in use in indigenous food systems that could really be important to feeding the world down the, down the line. Maybe I don't know, maybe we'll just go around the circle here and we'll start with Rebecca and then go to Tanisha and Amy and Chris just to get some some comments, some feedback from you on on the role that this kind of work may have for the future of, of everyone's food. Yeah, so let's let's go let's go in a circle. We'll just start with um, maybe we'll start with uh, Amy who's doing work on food sovereignty and then go to Tanisha and Chris and then to Rebecca. Like that's a fantastic question. And I think the first thing that I would think about and want to emphasize is that especially when working with indigenous foods and indigenous food systems, that these communities globally should have 
control over their own food systems. And that since we are not members of those communities, it is not up to us to bring those foods into some sort of agricultural scale. This is actually something that I got asked about pretty often in Australia when I tell people about what we were doing. Um, people would be like, oh yeah, so this is for us to farm in the desert, right? It's like, well, if that's what the community wants to do with this research, that's fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's up to the communities who have relationships with these plants to determine if these foods want to be used in a more commercialized agricultural setting or if they want to continue to care for country in the way that they've been for thousands of years. That kind of really ties into the Nagoya protocol, right? And mm -hmm. access and benefit sharing considerations. Um, yeah. And Tanisha? Yes, that's um, such good points to bring up, um, Amy. And the first thing that comes to mind when we're thinking about food security and things like that is um, something that Rebecca says a lot is making sure that we respect indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is uh, science scientific knowledge, it's rigorous scientific knowledge. And so just referring to the community, I think the communities are aware of their food systems and what's going on on the land because they're deeply tied to that. That's something that a lot of Western societies are not, but Aboriginal peoples and Indigenous peoples are deeply tied to the environment their food systems, and they're really out there managing and looking at these systems every day where they can tell that something's different or something's coming or something's off. And um, I think just respecting that knowledge, and that's what we try to do with this project, this is something that they wanted to know about the uh, genetic health of their populations. And so we're doing that in collaborations with them, but not to commercialize it or things like that. It can safeguard these foods within their own community. And I think that's kind of where we should stop <laughs> until, unless that's something that the Mardu community wants to expand upon. But just respecting their uh, traditional ecological knowledge and knowing that this is scientific, factual knowledge is, um, it's going to safeguard them from things like climate change. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'll give a yeah one of those yes and moments, right? Yeah, because there's also a lot of important things we can learn from from this kind of research that we're doing, right? That that by looking at how the the that community is managing their landscape and then seeing sort of the, some of the results that we're seeing. For instance, with, you know, Tanisha mentioning the fact that we're actually seeing an indication that the the populations of this one particular species are are more genetically healthy in in the place where they're being managed in a traditional way that's been going on for a long time, versus is outside of that, I think says a lot about right how we use landscapes, how we think about agriculture, right? Rat these are not monocultural systems with lots and lots of inputs, right? These are managed systems that are based on a deep knowledge of the landscape and the sort of ecological processes that happen by nature in that landscape, and then using those as a way to manage for 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 food plants, right? And uh, I think there are some pretty important lessons to be taken from that approach to growing. I want to pick up on that point about about agriculture and food sovereignty. I mean, for for Mardu, you know, it's right. I yeah, everybody said everybody said some great great things about about you know the relationship between food sovereignty and these plants. And it's their it's their plants, right? And it's it's a kind of sovereignty that's generated from their ability to get out on the land and to burn the land, right? Without that ability, and that's something that people don't recognize. Without that ability to do that these plants won't continue to exist, right? And so, you know, development projects that, that attempt to address things like food sovereignty need to take into account this longstanding sort of practice that people have with the landscape and how that sustains their food systems um, as, as a result of just the outcome of that practice. And that kind of brings up this issue of agriculture, like, is it agriculture? Are these gardens, right? So. You know, when you look at these plants around the Mardu community, um, it's, it's very different from what those guys were seeing further north. Um, only when they got to a particular location that was um, heavily camped in by Aboriginal people, right? So in dense patches, what you see around these communities, there can be more than 1,200 plants per hectare, more than 200,000 calories of food per hectare. And the biggest patches 
can be several hectares in size. And in those patches, you can pick more than seven kilograms of fruit an hour. So you can camp there for days. You can support what Marty called a big mob of people. And Marty, you do call these gardens colloquially, co colloquially in English, but this isn't a garden in the way that we would envision it. And Marty really don't talk about it that way. Um, so, you know, they would, they would think, and they, what they would say is that, well, uh, you know, it, it's not a white fellow garden, right? This is not, it, it's not a deliberate scattering of seeds solely for the purpose of creating and defending a patch of food for future use. And in fact, there's a really great story that illustrates um, how people think about these gardens. So um, one elderly, elderly woman, this was um, quite a few years ago, she burned a place for hunting. And the next year, um, after a big rain, it grew this huge, dense patch of bush, bush tomatoes. And she told everyone it was her garden. And if they were going to pick, if anyone else was going to pick fruit there, they should ask her. And everyone basically laughed and said, yeah, right, and went and got the fruit anyway. And so that they, they said basically that she didn't have the right to claim this patch for herself. And that right ended right after she burned the spot, hunted in it, and left for the day. That's amazing. I like, I like this idea of gardens and ownership and this you know, lack of ownership over spaces, this communal kind of perspective. So am I understanding correctly then, Rebecca, that the Martu are, are migratory people, that they, that they move around um, or do they stay in one location and just hunt in different locations? Yeah, it's complicated and it's also contemporary, <laughs> right? So we've got a contemporary community with infrastructure, um, you know, people have houses, um, there's, you know, there's a school, there's a, there's a small shop. Um, and so the way that they live their lives today is different than the way they would have lived it, you know, in the 1950s, right, before they had these sort of settlements. Mm -hmm. um, but they are still really mobile, right? So even though they have, they are tied to this community, um, they still, you know, move from one community to the next for different kinds of business. They're mobile across the landscape. And one of the things that allows them to be mobile are access to vehicles, right? Now, when you concentrate somebody onto a, a you know, a, a community and say, you got to live in this community, your kids have to go to school, right? And now people are like, well, how are we going to get out to go hunting and gathering if we're forced to be in this one small place? Because in a desert, you really have to be super mobile in order to make it. Yeah. So access to vehicles then becomes another one of those things that contributes to food security, right? And people often don't realize that. Well, and fuel is expensive, vehicles are expensive, it's tough to maintain them. And so people oftentimes will go hungry, um, they won't be able to access traditional food simply because they don't have a vehicle or they can't, they don't have enough to pay for fuel for it. Hmm. Yeah, it gets really complicated, really. like you said. That's, it's, we're at an interesting time, I think, for many, many indigenous communities, both with language loss. I mean, do they have a distinct language? Is that still intact? This is a big concern in many parts of the world because yeah. language loss and traditional knowledge is also tied to language. Yeah. Um, and that puts it at rest. We're very in, the, in these communities that most of the children grow up speaking their traditional language. And that, uh, that is, that is uh, very rare throughout the Well, fascinating. I, get, I think it just all goes to show the importance of traditional land management practices. I think we often, you know, those of us that are city dwellers look at fire as a very scary, dangerous thing. This idea of fire spreading across the landscape when, um, as you've described, it's actually a really important tool for managing landscapes. Um, it has been for, for millennia in many places across the globe. Yeah. And these plants wouldn't survive without this particular land management um, process. And I, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this for me is that I've been thinking about these plants sort of as in, in, as how they're responding to their sort of environment, almost free of like human involvement, right? Like, you know, this is, I'm so grateful to have been brought in on this project to think about this in the way that it really should be, right? Um, but thinking about these plants as being sort of fire tolerant, right? They, they are by their nature, but um, they also, you know, there's a there's a threshold at which it fires too hot, right? And some some of the fires we've heard about in Australia over the last few years have been fires that are very intense, right? And their frequency is is high, and very, and the fires are very intense, and that's that's actually not great for a lot of the plants that we even consider to be fire tolerant or fire adapted. And what's beautiful about this particular system is that, right? These are these are sort of like low intensity fires that are done in a way that's about responsible management, right? And it's actually pretty similar what you see in a lot of other parts of the world in sort of fire dependent habitats where you have these like uh, sort of 
uh, low frequency, low intensity fires. And, and, and that's what's going on in these communities. And that's actually benefiting the plants because they're sort of adapted to, to that sort of thing, right? So it's not just about any kind of fire. It's kind of about the, the appropriate kind of fire and the response the plants have to that. This reminds me of something that my, my PhD advisor would tell me. is like, there are no virgin forests. This idea of untouched land, of just pristine nature, doesn't exist. It hasn't existed for a very long time since humans have been on this earth. I mean, we're constantly, um, you know, shaping, sculpting, molding um, both landscapes and ecosystems through through different interventions and things that look wild to the untrained eye are often actually very, very finely engineered systems to provide resources. So I, I love this story. What a, what a cool wild tomato. <laughs> I hope to some, someday be able to taste it. Maybe I'll have to make a trip out to Australia. Or Pennsylvania. Or Pennsylvania to the greenhouse. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think that's about all the time we have today. Um, where can folks go to learn more about this project and your other work that you're doing? Um, I know you mentioned you've got the new episode coming out, Our Plants Are Cool Too. On, you can find that, listeners, on um, YouTube, on the Plants Are Cool Too channel. Um, other spots we can send them? Yeah, I'm happy to see folks over on, on social media. Uh, I'm at Martin Botany on Twitter and over at Instagram other places you all same here please see me on twitter and instagram i'm at t underscore marie underscore wms yes and i'll be tweeting about this as soon as things come out great well um thank you guys so much for coming on the show today this is a lot of fun i learned a lot um you know I, this is it's all an a fabulous family and just get more fabulous with each new discovery so um really exciting stuff Awesome. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, Gosh, thank you for having us. All right. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded for you today on Restream. I want to give a big shout out of thanks to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment for putting on a great show for you all each and every week. I also want to send you over to a couple of places to help us out in, in producing the show. You can head on over to mysterycontrol.com and pick up some cool swag. We've got lots of t-shirts and coffee mugs and um, bags and, and fun stuff um, to help support the foodie channel. And then you can also, if you'd like to, I'm always looking for that little extra um, kick of caffeine. You can buy me a cup of coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash foodie pharma. Those proceeds go towards again helping us put the show on each week thanks so much for listening stay healthy out there and i'll see you next time